This is Money, Motivation, and Mike, and I am your host, Michael Wainwright. In charge of all the controls, as always, is audio engineer Jason Wright. And hello to you, world. This is the show that will change your life. You can contact us at info at mx3.vip or find all of our content at mx3.vip or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at mx3 podcast. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to get notified of all of our new content, which comes out every Monday morning around nine o'clock. And once again, thank you viewing and listening audience as our subscribers on the YouTube channel continue to be over 70 thousand subscribers as we speak right now a couple of things i want to talk about today but a couple of tidbits to start with a big problem in american society today jason and one of the biggest things that is stopping people from losing belly fat and getting leaner all right i don't know if the united states of america is considered an obese nation but we are definitely an overweight nation, especially compared to the Europeans, uh, the Chinese, the Japanese, et cetera. So this particular poll, four options. What are the main, what, what is the main reason that people cannot lose belly fat and get leaner? Here's your four options. Not enough time for workouts, number one. Number two is unstable strict diets. Number three is stress and lack of sleep. And number four is metabolism is declining. What do you think it is, Jason? Uh, no time to work out. It's no, it, it, it's really all of the above to some degree. No time to work out was exactly what I guessed. Yeah. And no time to work out comes in and last at 14%. Really? Stress and lack of sleep is 48%. Unstainable diets, 24%. Not enough time for workouts and metabolism declining. Both come in at 14% each. Where's McDonald's rank on that? McDonald's, I'm going to get back to you on that one. (laughs) (laughs) The supersized fries? Yes. Yes, extra salt? Absolutely. Um, Stress and lack of sleep. Okay, well, there you go. Now, Another, another big item of, of interest that I ran across this week from the Gadget Review, uh, an, an article written by Lauren Christina. Past and present American presidents, how they ranked by IQ. Jason, you ever had your IQ checked? No. Well, I have. I had it checked a couple of years ago, back in 2022. Now, let me give you some things here before we get into the presidents because I think this is very interesting and, 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 and I believe you will too. 90 to 110 is normal or average intelligence. 110 to 120 is superior intelligence. 120 to 140 is very, very superior intelligence. Above 140 is near genius or genius okay uh there there's there's different things out there about iq one of them is is that the number can go on forever infinite but most of your of your test let's say will top out at 200 the normal the normal range on topping out is at 200 so here we go what do you think the average IQ is in the United States of America? A 105. Okay. So, as I already said, from 90 to 110 mm-hmm. is normal or average intelligence. Mm-hmm. The average intelligence in the United States of America is 98. Mm. Males are 99, average 99. Females, average 97. Now, I would have flipped that, and if males came in at 99 when it comes to smarts and intelligence, I would say females would come in in the hundreds because I believe, based on my 55 years of life, that females seem to be more intelligent than males. 
You think our female audience will now go up since I said that? It should. <laughs> okay. What do you think the smartest state is? Mm. How about, um, I'm going to say California. Oh. Probably the lowest, isn't it? Well, I, I, I think of Silicon Valley and such when yeah. I think of California, but. Oh, I think about all the bad decisions they make. Well, <laughs> nobody said they were governing well, properly out there. Since you said California smarts, and then all of a sudden you go to California being the dumbest, we'll just start with this. Politically. This particular article does say the dumbest state. Now, I would prefer to say the least intelligent state sure. is Mississippi. 94.2 is their average. And the smartest state, and you got to think about this, this makes sense. Massachusetts, Harvard, mm -hmm. Har okay, the considered the icon of iconic schools. Harvard University, Massachusetts comes in at one hundred four point three on the scale. Okay, yes, the top two percent of the United States is at one thirty two or higher. And just for the fun of it, I've got a few other people here. What would you think? Now, remember, 200 on average. And my article here that I have read, and I've also done some other research on IQs, uh, because after I took the test, I wanted to see where I came in with this particular stuff. I've come up with some other people, and I went and researched them to see what theirs were. Theirs is. Einstein, what do you think? I mean, it's going to be way up there, obviously. 160. Okay. I would, I would have said 150s. Here's some, guess. Here's some people that they mentioned in this article, or she did in this article. This article it came out one week ago. So since our last show and me stumbling onto this. And remember, I'm giving you some head up here before we get to the past and present pre American presidents. Einstein, 160. Bill Gates, 157. Jeff Bezos, 145. Michael Jackson, 159. That's uh, surprising. Arnold Schwarzenegger, 132. The governor. Okay. Now, here they, they threw some celebrities in here. Probably one of the top celebrities going right now is Taylor Swift. 160. Got the same IQ as Einstein. I don't believe that. I do. If mm. you, uh, the, the, the show that she puts on, mm -hmm. think about, she, she's she got her name on everything. Her mind just must be, well, obviously it's 160 uh, a genius. She just sits around and thinks of, I mean, she sat around during the pandemic and put all this stuff together that she's been doing for the last year and a half out there in the world and selling out stadiums three nights in a row and charging thousands of dollars for her tickets. It's smart. I, yeah. Hey, I, but, but is she going to go? I, I didn't, be I didn't part of the Manhattan project. I, I didn't say she's going to, uh, cure cancer. Yeah. I'm just telling you on, on, Hey, <laughs> You know, How many theories does she come up with? Stats don't They're always relatively. get you there, right? Stats don't always get you there. Yeah. Here you go. Snoop Dogg. Gotten he, a lot of headlines lately. He's pretty smart dude, though. Snoop Dogg is big at the Olympics. Yeah. And now the Olympics are coming to his his town of Los Angeles. 147. All right. It's pretty respectable. And they had to stick this one in here. Kim Kardashian. Okay. Give me a number. I... Well the, well, the trend's kind of high. Remember, I mean, remember this. I'll put her at 140. Her mama is the smart one in that bunch. Yeah. She, she, I didn't give her IQ, but I'd say her IQ is way on up there too. Yeah. Kim Kardashian checks in at 95. Okay. Yes. Bucking the trend here. Well, I just want to throw that out you. And then the last one here before I get into the presidents, they had to mention the Beatles. Okay. What do you think the smartest Beatle is? McCartney. Well, McCartney did not have the highest IQ, but they consider him to be the genius of the band. Mm -hmm. He's a perfectionist. He was the business mind. He he is what 
drove the Beatles. Lennon was the smartest. And the article uses the word dumbest, Ringo Starr. <laughs> and of course, they don't mention the fourth Beatle that never hardly ever gets talked about, George Harrison. He just collects the checks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's a smart one. Yeah, maybe he is a smart one. <laughs> stays out of the spotlight, stays out from behind the mic. Yep. And uh, gets the same 25% that everybody else gets. So there you go. There you go. Now, remember this. The average in the United States is 98. Now, here we go. Now, average male, 99. And to this point, the United States of America, we have only had male presidents. Now, I'm, I'm fixing to rip through these, but we got to start right off the bat. Who do you think has the least IQ to ever hold the office of the United States of America presidency? We'll go with the least and the worst, the least and the best. Oh, man, I'm not sure if I can think of every single president off my head right well, now. Anyway, you know this one. <laughs> uh, it is George W. George W. Bush. Yeah, comes in at 124. How about that? Oh, redneck boy from Texas. Jo George W. Hey, he's a Harvard grad. He went to school at the state that has the the highest well let's he, see he brought here. down that average in massachusetts well he's above the average 104 <laughs> he he's he's at 124 he's 20 points higher than the than the state's average okay <laughs> hopefully hopefully at 120 124 hopefully they put him in texas and helped out texas because texas did not make it to 100 Oof. yeah gerald ford 127 never elected to the office this one is surprising third lowest ronald reagan 130 and I'd put them way up there. Yeah. All right. Did different kind of smarts than what this IQ test tests well, for. Here, here's uh, Ulysses Grant. He comes in at 130. I mean, he he served 18, let's see here, 1869 to 1877, 150 years ago. Coming in here in the bottom half, the bottom five, George H. Bush, he squeaked out his running mate Ronald Reagan he is 30.1 on the IQ then we go through the William McKinley's and Grover Cleveland's here's another one that was very surprising to me Dwight Eisenhower 131.9 uh, and on on down the list okay George Washington 132.5 and remember we're talking about um 98 average, 99 for, for the for the men. Rutherford B. Hayes, 133.9. Just a few others here. You know, here's a president that I I have I don't guess I've even heard this name probably since fifth grade when you had to name all the states mm -hmm. and the capitals and the presidents. Franklin Pierce. 134.8. Did you do you remember Franklin Pierce, Jason? He I remember was, nothing about him. He was the 14th president of the United States, 1853 to 18, 1857. Did not have a second term. The 13th president of the United States, Millard Fillmore, 136. I'm not sure I even recall his name. I didn't either. Just to be real <laughs> honest with you. Okay. Now, John Tyler. You got, you got Tyler, Texas, etc. 136.2. James Monroe, 138.6. Andrew Johnson, 138.9. William Taft, William Harold Taft, mm -hmm. 139.5. James Buchanan, 139.6. You know, these are all in the last century. Harry Truman, 139.8. How about Zachary Taylor? Do you remember that name? I actually do remember the name. You remember old Zach? Yeah, I don't know any accomplishments he had, but well, he rose to fame in the he was he was a major in the in the U.S. Army. He was a general, and one thirty nine point eight. Chester Arthur. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of that name? Oh yeah, one forty one point five on his IQ. Twenty first president of the United States. LBJ. Mr. Central South Texas, 140.6. Herbert Hoover, Hoover Dam, 
141.6. Okay, Richard Nixon. He mm-hmm. was smart. 142.9. But not smart enough to get caught. <laughs> yes. The 37th president of the United States. Coming in at 145, President Obama. 148, Abraham Lincoln. 150, you know, you're you're up here in this genius category now. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 150. I believe it. And said he did not struggle at anything. Now, here's part of that Massachusetts bunch. JFK. Okay. 150.8. Theodore Roosevelt, 153. Woodrow Wilson, 155.2. Impressive education. He was well-versed, could speak multiple languages. This one is a surprise to me. 156, Jimmy Carter. Okay. Considered yeah. his 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 administration has, is not up there in the high rankings. And I would have thought he would have been towards the bottom. I guess just because you don't maybe run the Oval Office like everybody thinks, mm-hmm. then you're not that smart. But <laughs> he came in at 156. And by the way, he's still alive. Yeah. Uh, wasn't he? Didn't he have shown he's a little over 100? He's, is that right? He's in, I think he's in very difficult health. Yeah, it, it looked like it. Yes. In the, in the coverage I saw in the media. Okay. Bill Clinton, 159. James Madison, 160. Thomas Jefferson, 168. And the smartest president to ever sit in the Oval Office, John Quincy Adams, 175. 15 points higher than Einstein. Matter of fact, in this whole article and the people that I've looked up and the people that they gave us, some of these celebrities, John Quincy Adams was the highest IQ that I saw. I didn't see any in the 170s. He's at 175, the sixth president of the United States of America. How about that? Very impressive. Yeah. He's considered one of the most influential presidents to ever hold the office. Well, there you go. Now, you said you've never taken the test, Jason? I've never taken the test. Afraid, I, afraid to know. Well, I have. <laughs> You're not going to hurt my feelings, but I'll let you take a shot at what you think my IQ is. I took this test in December of 2022. I think I'm going to give you about a 145. <laughs> 146. Hey, I was pretty dang close. Well, you knew your brother was smart. Yeah, he's all right. 146. He's done all right for himself. Okay. Now, with the little time we have left here, I've got to start my teaser up for the next episode. And, you know, forget all this belly fat and getting leaner and all these IQs. Let's get down to some good stuff. On... October the 3rd, 1960, 64 years ago, we're just a couple of days from there, the Andy Griffith Show made its debut on CBS TV, and forever the life was changed. Still, the, the, the reruns you can find on several channels to this day. Okay, it was an American sitcom. Obviously, and it was it never left CBS. Ran from October the 3rd, 1960 to April the 1st, 1968 with a total of 249 half-hour episodes averaging from 25 to 26 minutes. Spanning eight seasons, Jason. 159 in black and white, which was the first five seasons, and 190 in color, which was the last three seasons. Now, I like the black and whites better. I can only recall it in black and white. Three seasons. Yeah. And, and what else is ironic about that is 
uh, uh, after season five, when they went to color for season six, that's also when Don Knox, Barney Five, left the show. See, I don't. I've watched quite a few episodes, not all of them, but I can only remember okay when he was in it. Well, give a little bit more tidbit here, and then I'm going to give you just a couple of things, and then we are going to come back because I can do I could do a month's worth of episodes on the Andy Griffith Show, no doubt about it. I mean, Andy Griffith Show takes me away from life when I sit down to watch it. And I have seen every episode 14 million times, it seems. I know what's coming. I know what's fixing to happen, and I still laugh when it happens. It, 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 it just doesn't get any better. So, if you recall, and you probably don't, after season four is when Gomer Powell, remember Gomer ran the gas station, mm-hmm. and he left the show, and his cousin Goober took over the show, took over the gas station. Gotcha. And Gomer went on mm-hmm. to have his own show, the Gomer Pyle, USMC. He went to the Marines. There was an episode there in 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 uh in in one of the uh, episodes there. I think it's in it is in four. It's in it's in the fourth season where Andy Griffith, Andy Taylor, takes Gomer, Jim Neighbors, to the to the Marines, and he joins the Marines. And that's how that's how that show. Gomer Pyle USMC started up. It was a spinoff of the Andy Griffith show. Mm. Okay. After, as season five was coming to an end, Andy Taylor, Andy Griffith was getting tired. And he told Don Knox that he was not going to renew his contract. So Don Knox obviously starts looking for him new employment, his new employment. And then that's when Don Knox, he didn't renew his contract, and he goes off and becomes no more sitcom a movie star by doing movies, The Ghost of Mr. Chicken, and 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 shows like that. He went and signed up for five movie series and made five shows, five TV shows, excuse me, five movies. And then all of a sudden, Andy Griffith has second thoughts, and he renews up his contract, and that's why Andy ended up staying for eight seasons, and then Don Knox made some spots uh, a couple of he goes home they call it and and then andy goes to raleigh and sees him because uh, barney becomes a detective in raleigh north carolina okay the series originated from an episode of the danny thomas show actually i did not know that until i got into this research stars andy griffith is andy taylor the widowed sheriff of mayberry north carolina do you know where Mayberry, North Carolina is, Jason? No, not exactly. It does not exist. It's a fictional community. That's why I wouldn't know. That's why you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Many people have went to North Carolina trying to find Mayberry. <laughs> it, it is a fictional town made up of two to 5,000 people. Other major characters inside, Andy's lifelong friend, obviously, and the well-meaning, enthusiastic, and bubbling deputy, Barney Five, played by Don Knox. Don Knox ended up becoming the uh, landlord on Three's Company. That's where I really know. Is that from. where you know Don yeah, from? Yeah. Oh yeah. And see, I I didn't care for that character. I care for Andy Griffith character. Yeah. Don uh, the Gomer, uh, uh, um, Don Knox and and Barney Five. Um, Andy's aunt, housekeeper, B Taylor, Francis Baver. She was the was the actual movie star on this show. She'd already been in movies and stuff for thirty year thirty year uh, uh, career. She was towards the end of her career, and she had her own thoughts and ideas on what's going on. And then, of course, the young everybody loves Opie Ron Howard, mm. who who took this, went to Happy Days, and then became a director, um, and and got into making his own shows, which uh, backdraft. Backdraft is him. That's and, right. And, and many others. You could do another episode on, on Ron Howard. So Griffith says, and this is quote, well, thought, we never said it, and though it was a shot, it, the, that movie, the movie was shot in the 1960s, it had a feeling of the 1930s. It was when we were doing it of a time gone by. And... Sometimes you just want to go to Mayberry and hang out because it was always, it's always great. 
it always ends great in that 30 minute process. The series never placed lower than seventh in the Nielsen ratings, ending its final season as number one. The only other shows to end their runs at the top of the ratings, there's only two. Any idea? No idea. 1957, I Love Lucy. Oh, wow. That should have been obvious. 1998, Seinfeld. Mm. The only other two shows to end at number one when they called it a day. Now, this is also interesting that I Love Lucy, Lucille Ball, the Andy Griffith show uh, was uh, on location, production, etc., on what originally became Desilu Productions in 1960 and turned into Desilu Culver. So Andy Griffith's show was filmed at Lucille Ball's studio, Desilu Productions. So that's that's also interesting, and she had a a lot to do with that. And actually, the first seven se- the first seven seasons, Paramount Paramount Studios was the was the eighth season, and I believe it's because Paramount bought out Desilu. They used one camera to shoot the Andy Griffith show. Oh wow! So when you are when they're focused in on Barney, mm-hmm. they're they're doing his scenes, and then when you go focus in on Andy, it's because they've 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 stopped, moved the camera, moved the camera, yeah, and redone the scene. So now they can get the Andy part of of the episode or of of the of that particular sequence. One camera yeah that'd be (laughs) tough i'd hate to be that editor (laughs) well and on top of that listen at this because you're saying about being an editor and you're talking about editing this show and you look at today's sitcom series whatever they're 10 to 13 episodes a season yeah here's andy griffith 32, 31, 32, 32, 32, 30, 30, 30. It's a lot of episodes. It is. And, I mean, they're, wouldn't you think they're literally shooting year round? I mean, it takes it takes a good, uh, they're, they're making a show every 10 days. Yeah. Yes. They debuted with 13,120,000 viewers. And the last episode had 15,640,000 viewers. They went up every year. Did have a dip, I'm sorry, from 63 to 64. They went from 15,170,000 average to 14,910,000 average. But every year they... Still strong number. Well, and their strongest season was season eight. So very, very interesting stuff. The, the production company, Danny Thomas Enterprises. Remember, this show started on the Danny Thomas show. Danny Thomas figured out real quick that he had something in Andy Andy Griffith. So he got involved, and he was the production company. Okay, think about this. Andy Griffith, Andy, the Andy Griffith show starts in 1960, ends in 1968, and the reruns started in 1964. They're already doing reruns while they're doing new episodes. Daytime reruns began airing during the fall season of 1964, and the show has been in syndication ever since. The reruns were retitled Andy of Mayberry to distinguish the repeat episodes from the new episodes airing on primetime. Oh, wow. (laughs) I've never heard of that. (laughs) Last couple of tidbits, and then we're going to come back to the Andy Griffith show next week, because like I told you, I can talk about this all the time. Something I've always been intrigued with was Ernest T. Bass, who only appeared in five episodes. Um, But he was also one of the directors on the show. Never directed any of his... His name was uh, Howard Morse. He never directed any of his own episodes, but he directed episodes uh, in, in the Andy Griffith show and also played Ernest T. Bass. Okay, this is also interesting. And those who have watched this show up upside down, sideways three times, the unseen characters, such as telephone operator Sarah. Sarah's never been seen, only her voice. 
Barney's love interest, local diner, diner waitress, Juanita Beasley. Never been seen. As mentioned in the first season, and often referenced both of these people, the show's announcer for the first five seasons, Colin Mel. He also portrayed Game Warden Peterson in episode 140, when Andy and Helen have their day. But Sarah and Juanita, those are big time names in the Andy Griffith show, and they were never to be seen. Money, Motivation, and Mike continues to bring you information, enjoyment, pleasure, controversy, a lot of things that we do throughout this show that has put us at episode 120 today. 120. 120 episodes, and Andy Griffith sent 249. So that tells you a whole lot about how much Andy Griffith was going on in the 1960s and is still going on today, present day 2024. You can always find our content at mx3.vip and you can always contact us, info at mx3.vip or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at mx3podcast. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to get notified of all of our new content, which Jason puts out every Monday morning around 9 o'clock. So work real hard in trying to get more sleep and less stress. It will definitely help with you losing your belly fat and getting leaner according to popular opinion. Till next time, for everyone who's been a part of Money, Motivation, and Mike, continue to live your life the right way. <laughs>